All right, so we're looking at the spatial hierarchy of the biosphere. And here's some examples. This is a grassland grazing community. So this is an area here in, uh, I believe, right in the border of Kenya and Tanzania. And it is this community right here. You have various populations of zebra and of wildebeest. There's lions off here, uh, plants and small trees and shrubs. And all these populations together in this area is a grassland community. Here's a tide pole community on the west coast, right? So this is an area where it's submerged for 12 hours a day and covered in water when the tide comes in. So you've got this mixture of plants and animals that can handle this type of dry than wet community. Okay. Now part of this is the carbon and nitrogen cycle. Part of this is the movement that helps facilitate these communities. Right? Because all life needs certain chemicals to live. We all need water, right? And the other ones we need are carbon and nitrogen, water, phosphorus, all these chemicals. Without these chemicals, life would not be able to be built. So the nitrogen cycle is just part of this. And this is, I'm not going to so much quiz you on this. I want you to know it exists. But basically, just like the water cycle, how does nitrogen move through the Earth's systems? So nitrogen can often start off as a gas. It's actually the most, uh, the most of the atmosphere is nitrogen. The, the effect of atmospheric fixation, uh, lightning, interaction with bacteria, it gets turned into uh, nitrates, which is a basically a ground-based uh, chemical of nitrogen. Often we use them as fertilizers. Nitrates help plants grow. The plants take the nitrogen, they eat it, fertilizer, which then is turned into parts of the cells of the plants, which the animals eat. So the big thing to take away here, right, is that nitrogen moves in various ways and various states of matter through the biosphere. And the same thing with carbon. We talked a little bit about the carbon cycle, right, with um, the climate change. But again, just remember the climate and carbon can move through many ways. Carbon is in the air, CO2. It can be converted or stored in the land or in the ocean. It could be released back into the atmosphere through various functions as well. But carbon moves these three stages. All right, so now, after all of this, we're going to end again with kind of the human story, I'm talking about biogeography. And the coconut is a great example. So as I talked about before, coconuts, right, come from palm trees. And the coconut is the seed of a palm tree. But it's very well adapted. It evolved this very unique way of dispersing. So it looks like this big, huge hunk. It's pretty waterproof. So if a coconut falls into the beach and rolls into the water in the ocean, it'll float. And it can float for a long time because inside that coconut shell, there is that coconut that we eat, that white stuff, which is food for the seed. And there's actually a little bit of water. And it can float in the water. What happens is it can float from island to island. And when it washes up on the beach of another island, maybe hundreds of miles away, it can start growing. And that's how palm trees grow. Now, you can see that coconuts actually right here, before humans domesticated them, because we actually grow coconuts for food and for oil. But they started off right here. There was a variety that grew right here in the Indian Ocean and one that grew here in the Pacific. And this was their natural range right here, right here and right here. But because humans domesticated them two different times, two different ways, they brought them with them. So uh, Polynesians, as they expanded through the Pacific Ocean, uh, they eventually they come through here, they go through Papua New Guinea, they eventually colonize all the islands of the Southern Pacific all the way up to Easter Island and Hawaii. They bring coconuts with them. And so the this was the result of human interaction. This is where they naturally started. This was their natural range. Humans expanded their range. Now, why didn't they go any further south? They don't grow. It's too cold or too dry. They can't grow in the middle of a cotton. they got to be in the water, and it has to be a certain temperature. Now, look at this. The Indian variety right here. Then how did it make it over here, right? Well... Again, this area would be perfect range for it because it is the right humidity and it's coastal, but there's this huge gap. And the reason it got across was humans brought it with them. Uh, Spanish explorers brought this with them to grow as food and moved it. So this is what makes it so well right here. This is the coconut, the outer shell that we see it floats, but inside this right here, 
This shell is food. It's like a seed. Inside is a tiny little seed. This is water. So it's basically a little, it's a big self-contained floating seed. And it can float for thousands of miles. So humans brought the coconuts from New Guinea all the way here to Hawaii and Easter Island. They brought it with them. Europeans brought the tree here to the Atlantic. Okay. Now, there are more than two types of coconut trees, actually. In fact, there are, I think, about 80 different trees. And that's because humans bred certain trees for certain fibers. Sometimes they want trees that have the biggest fruit on the coconut, that white powder that we get. So they only allowed trees that had really big coconuts to grow. And those trees got bigger coconuts every year. Or maybe they grew a tree that made the most coconut oil, which is used in industrial purposes. And so with artificial selection, we chose what coconuts to plant and what to not. And we were choosing for certain traits, right? We basically artificially manipulated evolution. And so today, there are 80 different types of coconut trees, different heights and different sized fruit. So this kind of illustrates a lot of things we talked about. The idea of geographic range, of how things would move naturally, and how that could be altered, and what happens when it's altered. And then evolution. Now, how do we go from one or two coconut species to having 80? So I know this chapter was a lot of stuff to throw at you. I find it very interesting. Uh, hopefully the uh, other material helps you as well. And as always, if you have any questions or comments or concerns, please let me know.